Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Edgar Garcia. I'm the president of ASCE. Uh, ASCE is uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers. So for ASCE, we focus on helping young professionals as yourself develop skills to build connections and teamwork and lifelong friendships with other professionals. And through various clubs run under ASE, we have uh, students learn critical thinking skills outside of the ordinary classroom. And for me, ASE has not only allowed me to succeed in uh, engineering, but helped me navigate through uh, different classes as well and through the help of other students as well. All right, so for those who don't know me, my name is Cheryl Ehrman, and I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering, and I'm really happy to welcome you today for our speaker. Uh, so our speaker today is Mr. Eric Law, who holds the title of Senior Director of Technology and Innovation at Swinerton Builders. Uh, just like you, Mr. Law uh, was a student in a CSU school, uh, and he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering at a different CSU at, um, from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, he then founded and ran EA Doc, which is a company that created cloud-based program management software for the construction industry, and that was from 2006 to 2015. When EA Doc was acquired by Bentley Systems, he led its construction product team from 2015 until uh, the December of 2017, and he joined Swinerton in January 2018 as its senior director of technology and innovation. So in this role, he pushes technology's limits to elegantly solve construction business problems. So you'll hear more about that in his talk. Uh, to escape technology, uh, he heads to the mountains with his family to ski, mountain bike, and even climb a rock or two. So interesting, nice. <laughs> so once again, please help me welcome Mr. Eric Law, Senior Director of Technology and Innovation. All right, thank you guys. How's everybody's afternoon going today? Good? All right. Um, so I will have questions. Please don't let me just sit up here and talk for 45 minutes. I want you guys to interact. Uh, but what I'm going to do is give you guys a little background here on Swinerton, uh, the company that I work for today. Uh, so we're a 131-year-old general contractor. Uh, we have license number 92. Uh, our company is really focused on people uh, at Swinerton. We're 100% employee-owned. We have about 18 offices spread across mostly the western half of the U.S. and the southeast. We're a growing general contractor. About 1,600 professional employees, project engineers, project managers, our admin staff, and about 1,800 craft employees and growing. It's one of the fastest growing segments of our business. About seven years ago, we had no craft, and today we're up to 1,800. And we expect to double that again over the next couple of years. Uh, a little bit of background on what we do. So at Swearington, we have our general construction business. You've probably seen our signs on some of the bigger projects. Uh, we focus on things like aviation, education, multifamily, residential. Uh, one of the fun facts about Swinerton is we're actually the largest uh, renewable energy contractor for photovoltaics. Um, we put in X hundreds of megawatts of uh, photovoltaics out in the deserts. We have a group that's focused purely on that. Uh, so we have a diverse business line uh, and lots of different groups. Uh, we're a self-performing general contractor. So those 1,800 craft I put up, they work on things like concrete, formwork, parking structures, demolition, drywall, millwork, cleanup. Uh, those are our self-performed groups. So one of the big advantages of being a general contractor that self-performs is I can actually change the workflow process because I have the subcontractor and the general in the same firm. So it actually gives us some advantages in terms of how we want to make changes with our organization. So how did I get here? How did I end up on a stage giving a presentation on innovation for Swinerton, right? <laughs> When I was in your seats about 20 years ago down at Cal Poly, I did not think I'd be leading an innovation team, right? Um, so I graduated from Cal Poly back in 2001. Uh, go Mustangs, for those of you here. It's not like when I'm at Cal now, I'll go, go Bears. Um, I tried starting a company in uh, 99, you know, like everybody else. So for those of you that are familiar with the dot com back in 99, 2001, there was a ton of startup companies. There's lots of venture capital going everywhere. Uh, and you'll see on this graph over here, this little event happened here November 1st, 1999. The stock market hit this peak, and then a year later it hit a valley. And about 90% of the companies that existed at that time don't exist today. Uh, many of the companies that we know, for example, this favorite icon over here, pets.com. How many of you have ever heard of them? Shipping dog food. Turnout technology couldn't solve that problem. It's still expensive to ship dog food. 
Um, so the dot-com bomb became phenomenal with this. Now, the one thing that I want to point out is back in 1999, uh, 2001 is when we peaked. And we're doing about $35 billion a year in venture capital here in North America. It was getting invested in startups. Over here on the bottom left, you can see we're still not back to that peak. Even today, we're still about $20, $21 billion a year in VC. So it was pretty phenomenal amounts of money going into ideas that would never, ever make businesses. So needless to say, me launching a software company when the dot-com bomb went off was not a good idea. So I ended up going to construction. Construction was hiring, uh, a lot of civil projects and stuff like that. So I ended up going to work for Kiwit, where I was an estimator and project engineer doing water treatment plant projects, transit projects. Uh, and that's where I got my background in construction and learning about the heavy soil space. Uh, from there, I had an opportunity to join a startup in San Francisco. They were doing these tablet devices um, back in 2002. Uh, really cool devices, some of the first tablet computings for inspectors on DOT projects. After two months, they ran out of money, and I had to go find a new job. Right? Still love startups. So I went to a better-funded startup company called Cordis, based out of the Netherlands. They were funded by a billionaire uh, from the Bonn ERP days. Uh, much better funded, spent a couple years there doing middleware implementations for large-scale enterprises. Um, and that's where actually I met my business partner for EA Doc. He was a solution architect. And so he and I were talking about what can we do next. Um, I shared with him the idea for EA Doc, which had come when I worked at Qit. And then from there, we started building it on nights and weekends. Spent nine years on that, and then we were acquired by Bentley. So I finally, second one was much more successful. Got an acquisition, got to join a large startup company, or a large software company. And then in 2018, I got an opportunity uh, to join Swinerton. Swinerton was looking for somebody to lead their innovation program. Uh, they wanted somebody with construction experience and with technology experience to come in and build a group that could change how we deliver projects. Um, so that's my background, and that'll take you guys through a little bit about what I do at Swinerton. So how do you build an innovation program at a 131-year-old company, right? Swinerton's got a great track record of growth. They've got phenomenal employees. They're a services business. Uh, so what we do, we start with a quote. So the good news is our CEO, Jeff Hoops, he had identified innovation as one of our key parts, integrity and innovation, are one of the key foundations of Swinerton. We didn't have a formal innovation program at the time, but they knew it was a part of business and they knew change was inevitable. Um, our executive team at Swinerton has all come up through the ranks. They've all been with Swinerton from 20 to 35 years. So they've all seen multiple ups and downs in the industries, different changes with construction, and they know change is inevitable. So they'd spent some quality time there. Now, the one thing we did know when we were setting up our innovation program is who we didn't want to be, right? We'd known that companies out there. So one of the things I had to do was go to the executive and say, here's why we should have an innovation program. Here's what it looks like. Uh, so we took a look at history, for example. Kodak, HP, Nokia, Blockbuster. Some of these companies you guys have probably never heard of, right? Everybody today is familiar with Netflix, right? Download it. Netflix actually shipped CDs at one point in time. Uh, they pretty much wiped out Blockbuster, who had VHS and some DVDs. Um, but if you take a look at, you know, Fortune 500 firms, only 60 remain since 19, 1955 versus 2017. So that means 440 firms disappeared, acquired, merged, but they no longer exist today. So we know change is continuous. And if you don't keep up and change and evolve, you're going to become obsolete. The other thing, too, about construction is we're the largest industry in the world. In the United States, $1.3 trillion every year gets spent on construction projects. That's everything from high-rise residential, condos, bridges. You guys see a lot of it right now. There's a lot of infrastructure in place. Uh, within our industry, productivity is not improved. And what that does is when venture capitalists see that, it gets their attention. And so you'll see we went from $4.5 million in 2008 in venture capital into construction tech to $1.6 billion in 2018. That's a phenomenal change. So there's a lot of technology and a lot of money now chasing construction companies. So how do we validate that, right? How do we make sure that we pick the right solutions? Because we know 90% of those are going to be complete flops, right? VCs know 90-10 rule. 90% of the solutions they fund will fail, only 10. So for us at Swinerton, in our innovation program, how do we identify partners that are going to help us move forward and make them successful as well? So what we want to do is take a look at this is an example of a firm out of the UK. The factory is allowing us to construct one And what these guys have done is they moved the factory hours, to the job site. A step change in productivity and efficiency. Within a one week cycle, we were able to install precast perimeter columns and twin walls, insert ventilation, drainage, and MEP service modules while lifting and placing modular bathroom and utility pods. Once the floor is complete, the whole so the audio is not so good, but essentially in seven days, they're completing an entire floor. Concrete, 
HVAC, cabinets, everything seven day cycle time. Right now in the US, depending on our projects, it takes us three to eight weeks as our cycle time. So for these guys to reduce it to a third is pretty phenomenal. Uh, and what you'll notice is essentially they built a big tent, a big manufacturing facility on top of it, and then it just self climbs up the tower. Today, we bring all the components and pieces in and fabricate and that. They actually brought the manufacturing facility to the job site, which is pretty ingenuitive. And this is a company out of the UK that's done this on those two towers over there and it's a very successful project and they're gonna be doing it again. But these are kinds of pressures that we have to take a look at. You know, if we look at construction history, we haven't seen a whole lot of major innovation, right? We still use hammers and drills and stuff like that on our projects. And so as we start to see big drivers, people are starting to think bigger and we're starting to see outside competitors as well on our projects. Mouse back here in alignment. Factory. The other thing that you'll find too is robotics. So with construction, we still have to physically put work in place, right? I can't virtualize the entire thing. So this is actually a robotics company that we're working with that actually does the layout on concrete slabs. Cute little Roomba sized box, right? That goes in, prints numbers, prints walls, and stuff like that. And so what we've done is we've partnered with this company because they have no construction experience. They know we have a problem, but we have all the expertise. I've got lots of people with construction knowledge, but I don't have any roboticists on my project team. So what we do is we partner with these guys to help them refine their solution and get out on the job sites and test and validate it, right? And so we're seeing innovation that comes in and can actually do physical work on the job site. Uh, and this is a huge improvement for us, right? Because I can improve quality, consistency. One of our biggest challenges right now is labor force. Right? I can't hire enough people to run my jobs. And then the people I do hire aren't always trained. Right? So we're having to train all the resources to get the craft. So with robotics, we can actually deploy this and give ourselves consistent quality and performance every time on the project. So how do you set up an innovation program? So when we went to the executive team, I told them 90% of my projects are gonna fail. And if you do that in construction, typically you get fired. Right? They gave me about five more minutes to explain myself. Because we're using the venture capital model. I know most of the startups I partner with, most of the ideas we test, but I expect a 10x return on investment. And so what I did is I defined a process that we were gonna run our ideas through. So we start with essentially a, a napkin sketch, a concept. You know, if I invest a million dollars in this initiative, can I generate $10 million in profit margin from it? Right? So we used a very similar concept that the venture capitalists use to evaluate and run our projects. And then we go through validation, you know, is the technology available? Can we change the people? Can we deliver this in the field? And then at the end down there, we get to the cost phase, which is pilot it. Can we test it and validate it? And then the green arrow, production, right? Once we've proven it out on a pilot project that it will work, that this transformation or this new way of building projects will work, then we take it and we scale it across our enterprise, right? Because I don't want to take a pilot project and try and scale it, right? I got to prove it. I got to prove to the executives and division managers that it's viable. And what we do is we have to measure it. You know, what are the tangible benefits? Profit margin, revenue growth. What are the intangibles? Culture, right? How do I get people to change? Because one of the key things that we're doing with innovation is we're actually changing people, right? I have to get people used to a new way of doing business, a new way of doing their work. Now, on the analysis side, we gotta get some numbers and spreadsheets, right? We gotta crunch the numbers and prove it out. So this is a, um, one of our projects, this is return on investment from a prefabrication initiative. So essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at prefabbing components and bringing them to the job site and kits of parts. So no more cutting components on the job site from raw material. This is for steel framing. And what we did is we looked at our steel stud labor, our materials, labor savings, material cost, and we forecasted out over a five year period that we could pick up 8.7 million for this particular division in profit margin. Now we're in construction, two to 3% profit margin is really good. Right? So we move a lot of revenue through our books to generate the profits we do. So for me to come up and say, hey guys, for this single division, I think we can grow at about 15% to 8.7 million is very oppressive and attractive. Right? So we're looking for these big ideas. But this is a group of folks that's very risk averse. Most people in the construction industry are not looking at shiny objects. So what I have to do is I have to break this down to pieces that says, here's how I'm gonna prove it. Right? So I take this out to a pilot project, we go do it on a job site. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you think the executives approved this one for pilot? Yes. Yes. Um, so this one went to pilot this last summer. Um, now one of the other things that we're always working with is learning curve, right? Anytime you introduce something new. So this is a two-story project that we tested this on. The first floor, we were 30% over labor budget. Not looking so good for us. But the second floor, we were 30% under labor budget, right? So a 60% change there between the first and second floor. 
And what that did is it showed the executives and all my division managers that are responsible for this group that yes, this is possible and doable. And what it did is it got them all lined up that said, okay, let's go test this on larger scaled projects. Because our key thing is proving it. I have to prove it in the field that these ideas are gonna be successful, right? I've gotta get past all those no's, it'll never work, you're crazy, this is a nuts idea, and I gotta prove it to the people in the field, right? Because the only way I can change people, especially in construction, is to actually demonstrate it in the field, here's how we're gonna do it. The ironic part is we reached out to another project team, and this guy wrote me a two-page email of why his project should not be used. Long-winded, and so we're like, okay, not him, we're gonna go find somebody else. I got lots of projects to pick from. But even after we'd proven it on one project, we still have to get individual project teams on board, right? Lots of no's here in the industry. One of the things we're gonna take a look at is, you know, why do people say no, right? There's two things you can do. Some people say no, because not now, not for these reasons. You gotta understand what the reason is. How do I get to a yes? Because if every no I took, I said, I'm done, I'm not gonna touch it, my group is shot down. We will never, ever make it. Right? We have to take those no's and we have to dig in and we have to understand exactly why are people not engaging with us? Why do they not want to pilot our solution? Right? And so we got to understand, is it cost? Is it time pressure? Is it available resources? Is it trying something new? And as we dig into that, we can understand what that yes looks like. You know, do I break it back into pieces? So for example, one thing I had to do is I learned quickly is I had to de-risk my projects. Every project in construction is a miniature profit and loss. Right? They have to make a profit on the job for the PM and the team to look good. And so what I quickly had to do was go develop an R&D fund that I could use to fund risk and take that risk off my project teams. Um, and so I got approval for that. And so on that pilot project, I bought all the materials for the job. And I came to them, I said, guys, I'm gonna pay for all your materials. And they got excited. They're like, okay, we'll do this, right? Um, the other thing too is you gotta look at every no you receive means you're closer to a yes, right? Because no's are opportunities for learning, right? If somebody tells you no on this, you wanna understand why they're saying no. And then how can I apply that to the next project or the next engagement? It doesn't matter if you're in sales, if you're in innovation, R&D, you gotta take those no's and you gotta learn from them, all right? The other challenge with people, right? We got all kinds of people that we work with, right? 3,400 employees across our company, right? And I've got folks at this end of the spectrum, and I've got lots of folks at this end of the spectrum, right? I want my fax machine back. Right? Construction still has fax machines running around. We actually still have people sending faxes occasionally. Right? So how do I take innovation, we're sitting over here, and move it into our organization as a workflow? Right? Uh, there's a bunch of books called Crossing the Chasm. Right? How do I move these new ideas, these new ways of doing business into the majority on the bell curve there in the middle? Um, and so that's what we're doing in our innovation program. Right? We take these ideas, we identify them, we pilot them, we prove them, and then we get the rest of the organization to adopt them. Um, so my team lives up here at the front of the pipeline, right? We are the innovators that are constantly testing new ideas. We're the ones that people go, oh, those guys with those crazy ideas, that'll never work. Well, we know they do work, right? The cell phones, the iPhone, you know, Steve Jobs, he got that a lot. But guess what? We all have one in our pocket these days, right? It's reached that majority on the curve. So let's take a look at another one of our innovation projects that we tested out. So in construction, you guys probably see these on the road every day, us and all of our peers, the F-150 pickup truck. It's anonymous with construction companies. It's our driving billboards. You know, it's about 3,500 pounds, great for driving one person, right? 99.9% .9 of the time, those trucks are empty. It's one person, they really are just our billboards. So we had the idea that says, okay, our contractor field personnel need to get around in F-150s. Why don't we swap their F-150 for a Tesla Model 3? Right? Being here in the Bay Area, we got Teslas all over the place. Seems like a good idea. Uh, we did the ROI analysis on it. We took a look at, hey, what happens if we buy 20 Teslas and we pilot those, right? And we do a pilot program. Keep in mind in our fleet, we have over 400 F-150s. We spend over a million dollars a month on gasoline for those F-150s. And we're a small fleet. I was talking with Hilti, one of our major suppliers. They have 30,000 pickup trucks in their fleet around the world, right? because they have a huge sales force. Um, so we're looking at picking up $444,000 over five years, right? So again, if I extrapolate that out to my 400 pickup trucks, that's an extra million to $2 million a year in the bank. The other big benefits too with the electric cars is the maintenance. We have people that are driving over 40,000 miles a year on a pickup truck. That means almost every month they're getting an oil change. Every year they're getting new tires. They're just burning and churning through these vehicles. Um, so the maintenance things, you get carpool stickers. We have an office in San Francisco. We do a lot of work in San Francisco. 
If you have those carpool stickers, it'll shave a half hour off your commute going into San Francisco, right? Huge benefits. We had volunteers signing up, superintendents, charge at home, the whole thing planned out. What do you guys think? You think the executive team approved it? No? Why do you think not? They like the look of the trucks. They like the look of the trucks. Yep, you got it. So not so much the look of the trucks, but it's our clients. Optics. So in the construction industry, our clients are constantly pushing us on price. We're a services organization, so everything is about cost. Unfortunately, our clients have some, we call them skewed optics, where they believe that Teslas are associated with high-end vehicles, right, or luxury vehicles, even though we know the Tesla Model 3 is only 48,000, which is a little bit more expensive than the Model 3, and this would actually save us a lot of money. Uh, but the executive said, our clients have an optics issue, and that some of our clients would push back and complain about it. So we got a no on this one, but this no was a not today. They said, wait for the pickup trucks. So we got Tesla rendering, we got Rivian, we got Ford over there in the right-hand corner. We know they're coming. So they said in the next one to two years when the pickup trucks are out, let's put some Swearington logos on that. So it's a bummer because we'll lose out on a couple million dollars in fuel we'll keep spending on a monthly basis. But we know at some point in time we will make that transition off of the gas guzzling vehicles. Um, and so when we're going through this, you can see a couple examples of projects that we have pitched and presented where we've gotten yeses and nos, and they all seem pretty easy. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, one of the big things we do with our projects is field data collection. Where's my video link? So on construction projects, we generate a ton of data. Uh, and one of the things we're doing with that data... In, you can verify if the localization found a good match by looking to see if the new data in white overlaps with the prior map. Oh, come on, oops. Go back, play the video. I want the video without the audio. There we go. So one of the things we do on our projects is we generate a lot of data, a lot of manually entered data. So all of our superintendents, all of our foremen have daily reports and they're filling it in. And the problem with human entered data is it's not consistent. Foreman A doesn't do their daily report the same way as Foreman B and Superintendent A. So one of the things we're looking at is how do we capture data automated? How do I scan the project with these laser scanners? And what it does is it captures the as-built conditions. So I can capture quantity of work put in place, quality of work put in place with these tools, and then it can update my schedule, it can progress my job. And this is one of the tasks that most of our field teams hate doing. Nobody loves doing their daily reports or the paperwork at the end of the day or filling out the Excel spreadsheets. So we started piloting some of these tools. The only challenge we found is, as you notice this guy walking around, is it's very laborious. It took a lot of time. So our pilot projects and looking at these tools kept failing because we couldn't get engineers to spend four to six hours a day scanning their projects. And so what that did is it made us think, okay, how can we solve this problem, right? How can I take this initiative and these data sets and these scanning tools and go in and initiate another one? So a company called Boston Dynamics has a thing called Spot Dog. And so we saw a video and a presentation of this, and we're like, this is perfect. We will put a laser scanner and a 360 photo tool on top of it, and Spot's gonna go run our job sites, right? So this is pretty far reaching. This is kind of at that bleeding edge of construction technology for us to introduce robots on our job sites. So starting in January, we are gonna have Spot Dog on our job sites. Uh, we've actually put together a pilot project that got approval to go out and run spot. And this is what this is over in Japan where they had it on another job site. But what we're doing is on the back of it is the laser scanner. And the nice thing about robots is they love doing the same job over and over and over again. They will walk that same route every single time, super detailed. They will go up and down stairs, uh, which is what we really like about this. So this is actually our third robotic solution that we've evaluated for construction sites. Because the one challenge we have, unlike a manufacturing floor, is one, they're not flat. Two, we have junk all over the place. People leave extension cords and toolboxes and stuff everywhere. They're never organized. Um, and so we're gonna be evaluating this solution. And the key thing is, this project has to be successful for my other projects to be successful. So this one's got dependencies on it, right? So what we're doing is we're out capturing data so we can determine how productive are our crews. Are we installing the work correctly? Are we installing it fast enough? Um, this is what we do with our innovation program. And the key result at the end of the day is how do I drive profit margin? Right? How do I grow our business, grow our revenue, and improve our margins in a very tight industry? Uh, and this is what we do. And so you can see it here in some more examples. So 
So one of the questions I got for you guys, one of the things we do is we partner with startups. So I'm not gonna get funding for robotics. I'm not gonna get funding for all these AI ML solutions for my executive team. I get funding to evaluate them and test them on the projects. So one of the things we have to do is we have to have a very close relationship, right? And most people, if I said, hey, do you wanna be customer in one through three for a company, they're gonna say absolutely not, right? Typically, most people are like, hey, when it's on the shelf and it has a sticker price, I will negotiate them over the price, and that's my value proposition. Uh, so one of the things we do is we go and we work with these startups. And what we want to do is we want to understand the problem they're solving, how it aligns with our business, and what we want to do is help them be successful. Because as I mentioned earlier, we have the sandboxes, we have the test beds, right? I've got 180 projects running right now, from everything from a small TI to billion dollar mega projects in downtown San Francisco. And with that variety of projects, it gives me a lot of test beds to come in and bring these tools. So we bring these companies out to our construction sites, we expose some of these guys to construction sites. What's amazing is some of these companies will come up with a solution and they've never been on a job site, right? Which makes it very hard. If they've solved it in a laboratory, we know exactly which issues they're gonna have when they come to our job site. But the key thing I do with my project teams is I say, guys, I'm gonna bring a solution out here and it's gonna fail. And I want you to know that up front. And they're gonna learn from it and they're gonna come out again and again and again. And when we're interviewing our project teams before we select them, we make sure that they understand that process, right? That learning process. Because we have a lot of folks on our projects that are like, if it fails once, they write it off. They will never ever touch it again. And so that's not gonna work for us. We have to be able to bring solutions out, test them on our projects, have our project teams give them feedback and say, hey, here's what's working, here's what's not working, explain to them why it's a challenge, why their Wi-Fi crapped out on our job site. Uh, and then they take that back to the lab, they iterate on it, and they come back out. Um, and that's been a phenomenal success for us. And so this is actually a list of a bunch of the companies, about a dozen of these guys here that we've been working with. Um, so some of the robotics companies here, this is uh, that laser or that um, robot on the ground that was printing is a company called Dusty Robotics. Perfect example, brilliant roboticists, absolutely brilliant team to work with. They have no construction knowledge whatsoever. So us and a couple other firms have partnered up with them. Uh, same thing with Join on the top right, that was a software solution. Uh, Canvas here is another robotic solution. They're actually doing drywall finishing. Um, and keep in mind, all the solutions that we're working with today probably won't reach production for two to five years, right, in terms of mass market adoption. By the time these guys come out, prove it on job sites, do the pilots with us, we validate it. But the big advantage for us at Swingerton is we get to see what's coming. We get to take advantage of it. We get to partner with these guys. And then I get to introduce change to my job sites because a lot of our field teams are actually very excited about change. A lot of times when we work with our craft labor, they're like, oh, there's gotta be a better way. They're like, we're glad you guys are bringing this out. Because a lot of the work that craft does is backbreaking. You know, we were on a job site where this guy is about seven feet tall and he's bending over with a screw gun and sinking screws at his feet, doing a thousand of those a day, right? Not ergonomic at all, right? So we're actually designing a new tool for him and for his operations. Um, but that's what we do. We solve problems to improve productivity on job sites. And a lot of people ask us, you know, I've had people come up into the lunchroom and they're like, Eric, when the robots take over, what are all the people gonna do, right? And I'm like, for one, we're a long ways away from that. Trust me, these robots, they break, they fall down, they got a lot of learning to do. Um, the other thing too is typically when we bring these innovations in, what it does is it enables our people to do other work or more work. One of the challenges we have right now is our backlog in Swinerton is the largest it's ever been in the history of our construction company. And when you're a 131 year old construction company, that's a long history and to have a backlog of that size because we don't have people coming into the trades. Not just the craft level, but we have issues with project engineers, project managers, people coming out of universities as well. Uh, and so part of this innovation program is to also help with the cultural level, and that's to educate people that says, hey, construction, we're not just a bunch of idiots and pickup trucks, right? We're actually pushing technology and leveraging those new tools. You know, we have whole VDNC teams that we virtually build a building before we actually take it out to market and actually build it. Um, so we've got a lot of solutions, and we're introducing a lot more. So one of the big takeaways um, that you've heard throughout my presentation is people, right? I have to change people, I have to work with people, it's all about the people when it comes to innovation. Now for my innovations to be successful, I have to change the processes that they're doing, right? I can get incremental improvement if I change a process or the people. If I do both together, that's where I get my big gains, right? I have to change how we deliver construction, how we do it in the field, what the roles of the people are doing. And then technology over here is purely an enabler. Right? A lot of people associate technology and innovation as directly related, not correct. Innovation is about change. And what we're doing at Swinerton is we're driving change in terms of people, process, and then we leverage technology from those startups where it applies. Not all of our projects have technology involved. 
We actually have some projects that have no technology involved with them whatsoever, where it's purely people and process changes that we're looking at. Things like supply chain, purely people and process. Um, but a lot of ours do tie in there. And so one of the key things is, is with our company with 4,800 employees, there's three of us in our innovation team, that's what we're changing, right? We're driving change across a 3,800 person organization so we can continue to grow and be successful for the next 131 years, right? Which is a tough goal, but we know we have to drive change because as I showed earlier, companies that don't change and evolve, they go out of business, right? They're no longer along. And so I got a plug, so we are hiring. <laughs> got to put the slide up here. Um, everything from craft on up to engineering and management levels as well. So we hire a lot of civil engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, structural engineers, architects uh, within our ranks. We have a lot of different groups. Um, our headquarters is here in San Francisco. Um, so if anybody's interested in applying for a job, reach out to myself or hit up our website and uh, we'll get you connected with the right folks. So with that, thank you guys very much. We'll go ahead and open up the questions. All right, I'm sure there are questions. So questions, yeah. Uh, so you had mentioned um, uh, one of robotics is one of the things you're looking to introduce, um, but you had also mentioned you know they break down and they've got problems and a long way to go. So I don't know, just in your kind of personal opinion and assessment, uh, how long do you think it'll be before general contractors start to adopt robotics as kind of a, an integral part of some parts of what they do at least? Yeah, so today most of the trade contractors, for example, demolition, they have them. They have what we're calling you know, augmented robotics where it's people controlling robots. Uh, you'll see it in mining as well. So some particular areas of the construction industry already have robotics. Um, they're not fully autonomous. Um, they are what we're calling augmented. And essentially what we're doing is the robots are going into the most dangerous, difficult places to operate. So demolition's a good example. Um, and so we see them there very much. Uh, where you're gonna start to see them on every job site, kind of that broader adoption, we're probably about five to 10 years out before you'll see some type of robot on every single job site. Um, and then probably my guesstimate would be about 15 to 20 before they're building the projects, um, given the current labor thing. And as I mentioned earlier, the big driver is labor. Uh, labor here in San Francisco, we're one of the most expensive labor markets in the world right now. Um, not only is it expensive, but it's very hard to find. Um, and so that's really the big driver for robotics right now. Um, and the key thing with construction, as I mentioned earlier, is we have to put physical material in place, right? You know, some people use the analogy, you know, Teslas aren't built in your driveway, they're built in a factory. Well, I can't exactly move a 100-story office building from a factory into place. I still have to assemble it there. So we take a look at things like manufacturing processes, where they've automated a lot with robotics. Um, and how can we apply that to the job site? So similar to what we saw from MACE there is can we bring robots and manufacturing tools to a job site and make that final assembly? Um, but yeah, I mean, we have robots today, but the next five to 10, you're gonna see a much broader adoption. Um, I know we've had Wait, hold on for the mic, please. Oops. Oh, one second. <laughs> because this is being recorded, we need uh, to hear you. Uh, I know you kind of already uh, touched on it, but do you see any future backlash or compromise between local unions and the use of robotics on site? So we actually thought that would be a big challenge. Um, ironically, a bunch of the unions are actually signing up with the robotics companies. Um, so Canvas, the company that does the drywall finishing, they're actually a union drywall contractor. Um, they went to the union, they presented their solution, and they got signed up. There's another robot that does um, rebar tying back out of Boston uh, called Tybot. Uh, it's a union steel shop back there and they also went to the union. <laughs> the reason why the unions like the robots is it's actually replacing the most dangerous, the most um, safety challenged positions uh, and doing those repetitive tasks. Because the one challenge that the unions have is a lot of their good workers are retiring out. And so what the robots allow them to do is to keep those craft working longer because they no longer have to do those dangerous repetitive tasks anymore. Um, so quite a few of the unions are actually embracing the robots, not all of them, some of them it's a little tougher conversation than others, but the smart ones recognize it as a way to keep their labor force in place and working longer um, because they have the same challenge we do. They can't get young people into the trades. Yeah, these are really great questions. More questions? Yeah. yeah. I had a question about, um, I know in the video it showed the Dusty Robotics, it was sort of the same thing with CAD projects and 3D modeling. 
and printing it out. Is it a lot? Uh, is additive manufacturing a lot of stuff that you guys partner with? Sort of projects like big three D printers that print out construction and stuff. So the three D printers are still in the research phase for construction. Uh, we haven't seen many of them. We've seen some prototyping solutions come in. Um, you know, for example, there's the concrete house that they're 3D printing and some stuff like that. Much of that still is in the research phase. Uh, the biggest challenge with 3D printing and construction is just the volume of material. You know, if you look at our materials, concrete and steel are not the, exactly the easiest things to print. There's a really cool robot out of the Netherlands that's actually 3D printing steel. Um, and it shows them actually doing a bridge where the robot actually prints it as it goes over a uh, canal in the Netherlands. Um, so the technology is evolving, but most of it is still in the research phase. Um, uh, Zurich, ETH Zurich, uh, another university out of Switzerland, is doing some great research on uh, robots welding cages. So they've got one where it can actually fabricate an entire uh, rebar wall uh, using a robot and a welding arm. So there's a lot of interest in it. Um, and I think this time, and there's been interest in this over the last 25, 30 years, but I think we were reaching a tipping point with the labor pressures, the labor costs, the constraints on projects. You know, we have to build a lot more infrastructure to house our growing population, and the costs are getting too high to do that, right? Which is one of the challenges we have right now. The cost to construct is incredibly high, so how do we bring that cost down so everybody can afford housing? Um, so there's a lot of pressures on our industry to deliver. And so I think a lot of the research that's been going on from the universities you're gonna see coming out into production. All right, more questions. So I have one. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that when you took the job with the construction company that you had to learn about the whole construction industry. And I was wondering how, um, what tips could you give to our students when um, they're, they're in a situation where they have an opportunity but they're gonna have to do a lot of learning on the job about new things? Mm -hmm. Ask a lot of questions, right? <laughs> um, volunteer for a lot of activities, right? You know, one of the things when you're learning something new, obviously these days we have Google. Right? Everybody hits up Google and does their initial search and watches YouTube videos and stuff like that. But one of the things you can do too is spend time with lots of different people. So when I was a project engineer at Kiwit, I started out in an office doing estimating, you know, looking at drawings and counting quantities of parts and stuff like that to go on a project. And then when I won a project, I got shipped out to it. And that's where I got to meet all the subcontractors. I got to meet all the trades, the foremans, the superintendents, all the craft on our projects. Um, I got to understand from our senior folks, you know, we had people on the job site that were like myself with a couple years of experience, and then we had folks out there with 25 years of experience. You know, and I'd go out to lunch with the guys with 25 years of experience because you would learn from them. And not just from my own company. I'd go with the subcontractors, I'd go with the trade partners, our suppliers, our vendors. The one thing about construction is it involves a lot, like, lot of people. It takes a ton of people to build a project, way more than most people expect. Um, and so as you build that network and you talk with them and you learn about their parts and pieces and what they do, then you can start to identify either ways to improve the industry or ways to work with those people. Um, one of the things I learned about is personalities real quick. So I had two PG&E superintendents show up because we were gonna switch power on a job site and they were physically wrestling on how to pull electrical wire. These were two union linemen and I'm like looking at it and one of my foremen came over here and said, yeah, we run across this issue once in a while. You know, we get egos out there, and the way they solve it is wrestling on the ground. And I'm like, right. Well, learning curve from the new kid out of college, right? <laughs> but for those that have been around for 25 years, they go and break them up, send them their separate ways, and we figure out how to pull wire. Um, we do have some challenges with egos in construction, but sometimes they're very valuable when you learn how to leverage them. But the key thing is the people, right? You're gonna meet lots of different people uh, on job sites, lots of different personalities, and they all have to work together to deliver a project. You know, I was on a water treatment plant project as a project engineer. It was a $40 million job, and we would have 150 people on that job site, spanning us and our trade partners and suppliers and subcontractors at any point in time. A lot of people involved. All right, great. How about one more question, maybe? No? Okay, yeah, it goes to <laughs> So you mentioned um, your timeline for implementation running about five to 20 years, depending on what the technology was. And for our students in this room who are interested in construction, um, they will still be fairly early in their careers 15 yep. years from now. So uh, do you have, if you were a student now getting ready to graduate and go into this field, mm -hmm. what additional areas of study would you suggest they pick up perhaps their own reading? Yep. So if you're civil engineer, construction management, mechanical engineer, 
Um, for construction knowledge, you know, VDN, the virtual design and construction, understanding the models, the 3D elements, the 4D, the 5D capabilities, scheduling costs are all super valuable. Um, and those are skills that will continue on, right? Because when we look at a project with schedule and cost, it doesn't matter if I build it with robots or people, I still have a schedule and cost, right? Those are some skills and some fundamentals that will carry you through. Um, the other thing I'd encourage you guys to do is take a computer science class. Right? Learn about the programming of the hardware and the software and learn about computer code. Because what that's going to do is it's going to give you some knowledge to understand when you're working with software vendors. It's going to give you a little more domain knowledge about what they're talking about. Because you always want that overlap. You know, one of the biggest challenges we have is when I take field folks and I have them work with a software company, they say, I have no idea how they do it. Right? I have no understanding. I have no background in it. But it's awesome when it works. Right? They love their tools when it works. Um, because the challenge is they don't have a whole lot of patience for that technology. Right? And it's what I work with my tech companies and my tech partners. I say, guys, when we come out, don't oversell. Just show what's going to work, what's going to show value in this particular presentation. We're very good with our expectations. Because a lot of times when people don't understand something, that's when you get no's. Right? So if you jump into that technology just a little bit, you know, just take an intro to computer science class, that's going to set you guys up. Because even within the CAD programs, our VDNC team, they're writing scripts to automate the design processes within their CAD. All of our VDNC folks have some basic scripting knowledge on how to automate those processes and procedures. And so I definitely encourage anybody, if you're in civil engineer or mechanical, to understand basics of software and programming. I think that'll give you guys a huge leg up going into the construction industry. Let me pass the mic. What do you mean by the basics of computer programming? The basics? Yeah. <laughs> so when I was at Cal Poly, as a mechanical engineer, we had to take one computer programming class, and that was Fortran. And that was completely worthless, and that was 20 years ago. Right? Back then, that's when Java and everything else was coming back out. So the basics of computer programming, so object-oriented programming. Right? How does computer code run? How does it execute? Uh, what's a database? What is scripting languages? Stuff like that, that intro to computer programming. You don't have to write a full application, but I definitely recommend it. And I'm sure you guys have some courses here at San Jose State on intro to computer science, intro to computer programming that you guys can take. That'll help you guys. Um, and understand what runs. Because one of the key things in most engineering programs is you want to learn the fundamentals of that tool. Right? So even though my calculator does everything for me, I still know how to do the math in the back of my head if I have to check it. Right? So just like computer science, if you have an understanding of how the robots are thinking, how code is written, how it's executing code, It'll actually make you a much better partner working with these tech companies um, and working with those solutions in the field because they're going to break. right? Our guys in the field, we're going to have to teach them how to load software into robots, how to troubleshoot robots. right? We're going to build an operations team that can support those robots at some point in time. It's just a matter of time. And so the more people know about what goes on in those and how I deliver my, my model, my 3D object of a building, into the robots, uh, we do it today. We have lasers on our project where our VDNC guys give them a layout file, and the superintendents go load it into the laser, and then it puts dots everywhere there needs to be a wall segment. So we're starting to see that overlap of technology into the field, and the guys in the field have to understand how to take those files, how to upload those files, how to process those files. So. All right, thank you.